Welcome to my channel. If you want to catch my newest videos, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Teledyne stock and analyzing its financial ratios. Become a member and support the channel for 99 cents a month, or you can get a more in-depth valuation for $9.99 or $49.99 a month. The highest level is $99 a month for a private Zoom session to discuss financial statements. See the link in the very top of the description. Teledyne Technologies currently operates four major segments. Digital imaging is one, instrumentation is two, engineered systems is three, and the last one is aerospace and defense electronics. Let's get started with the model. This company has a market cap of $11.3 billion, so they're a large cap company. That's the value of the company according to the stock market. They're trading at 310 a share, and they have 36 million shares outstanding. To get the shares outstanding, it's market cap divided by stock price gives you shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. Free cash flow, that's how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows and then you discount that back to today's dollars. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are investments in property, plan, and equipment. So if you buy a building or large machinery, that's considered PP&A. If a company has positive free cash flow, it could pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back in the business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it might not be able to do any of those things. This company has positive and pretty consistent free cash flow each year, so that looks really good. Net income is a profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they also have positive and growing net income each year. So everything looks really good. If you notice, free cash flow is greater than net income most years, as I would expect, except for 2019. And I'll show you why. So to calculate free cash flow, it's cash flow from operations, which is up here on top, minus investments in property, plan, and equipment. To calculate cash flow from operations, you start with net income, which is right here, and you add back the non-cash items on the income statement. You also adjust for network and capital. Let's look at 2019. They had 402 million of net income, and we have to add back depreciation and amortization because those are non-cash items that get passed through its expenses on the income statement. And that was 111 million. They also had 30 million of stock-based compensation but they had that every year. Same thing with depreciation and amortization. The main difference I saw in 2019 was this negative 18 million in changes in accounts payable. When a company uses accounts payable, that's when you receive a product or service without paying for it at that time. You'll pay for it in the future. So it's like a loan. So in prior years, they used accounts payable. In 2016, they used 53 million of accounts payable. So that added 53 million of cash, because that's a loan. Same thing in 2017, 69 million of accounts payable, 31 million in 2018. But when they pay for the accounts payable, similar to paying for a loan, it comes out of cash. So it reduces your cash balance. So cash flow may get affected from products you received years ago. Similar to taking a loan 10, 20 years ago, you're still paying for it now. So that was a big difference in 2019, this negative 18 million of accounts payable. But they still had a pretty good free cash flow, 393 million. It was just a little less than their net income. Usually I expect free cash flow to be greater than net income unless the company is investing a lot back into their business. But in this case, it was just a changes in accounts payable. Revenue looks really good. It grows quite a bit each year. Their margins are also improving, which is good. They're becoming more efficient. Net profit margin is net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. So the higher your expenses, the lower your net income, the lower your net profit margin. So in 2019, this company converted 13% of its revenue into profit. And in 2016, it only converted 9% into profit. So it's doing a better job at managing expenses. Let's look at a capital structure. They have $851 million of debt, $2.7 billion of equity. 
and the interest rate they pay on the debt is 2.47%. Cost of debt is 2.1%. And to calculate cost of debt, it's interest rate times one minus the effective tax rate. And they only have 24% debt in the capital structure, which means they have 76% equity. The cost of equity is 9.69%. To calculate cost of equity, we use a capital asset pricing model. And part of the CAPM model is the beta. The beta is how volatile the stock is relative to the market. And their beta is pretty close to one. The market as a whole has a beta of one. So this stock moves with the market. It's not too volatile. And the WAC is 7.88%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. So if a company wanted to take on a new project, it would look at the cost of the project and then it would discount the future cash flows using the WAC. So for example, if a project cost a million dollars up front and you will receive $100,000 of free cash flows each year for the next 20 years, you would discount those 20 years of future free cash flows back to today's dollars using the weighted average cost of capital. And say for instance, the discounted future cash flows was 1.5 million. You would take on the project because the project cost you one million that project would add five hundred thousand dollars of value to the company but if the future free cash flows when you discounted them back equaled eight hundred thousand dollars you would not take on a project because you'd be losing two hundred thousand dollars you'd only want to take on projects that add value to the company so the WAC is a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows for this model we estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 10.5 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $9.5 billion. We divide that by 36 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 260. They're trading at 310, so they're trading at a 19% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street is a little higher, they're at 271, so they're saying the stock is also overvalued. Their valuation is based off of the average analyst estimate. Let's see where the stock has been trading the past few years. So it seems like the stock price kept going up for about four years to around 350 at its peak, then dropped a lot of coronavirus, then came right back up to its all time high, then dropped again. So it's now it's sitting at a slight discount to its all time high, but it seems like it could be a little overvalued at least according to my model. But stock price is not based off of how well a company is doing. That's just a function of stock price. The only indicator of stock price is supply and demand of the market. If more people want to buy a stock, it will push the price higher. And if more people want to sell a stock, it will push the price lower until equilibrium is met. It doesn't really matter how well a company is doing financially. A company can be doing really well financially but their stock price is going down because investors feel the future may be poor for the industry. On the other hand, a company may be doing really poorly financially but their stock price keeps going higher and higher because the future of the company, at least according to investors, looks really strong. That's the hardest part of the market is trying to understand market sentiment, the psychology of investors. If you could understand that, you'd be rich, but no one has figured that out. Let's look at the financial ratios. Not such a great PE, the median for the entire market is 16.5, the average is 18.4. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. I like to see below 15, they're at 28, so investors are paying $28.10 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is a little high, the median is 2.0, the average is 4.7. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. I like to see below 2.5, they're at 3.6, so investors are paying $3.60 for $1 of revenue. Price to book is decent. The median is 2.4, the average is 4.9. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. I like to see below 3.5, they're at 4.2. So investors are paying $4.20 for $1 book value. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. 
They have a really good interest coverage ratio. The median is 4.0, the average is 13.2. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. I like to see above 2.0, they're at 23.4, so they can easily cover their interest payments. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes. It's called operating income on the income statement. ROE is decent. The median is 12%, the average is 13%. ROE is net income over equity. I like to see above 20%, they're at 15%. They have a good current ratio. The median is 1.3, the average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. I like to see between 1.2 and 2, they're at 1.7. Current assets are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months. Current liabilities are debts and payables that are due within 12 months so they can cover their current debts and payables, which is good. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Fleur, 2.6, and Keysight, all in the same industry as Teledyne. And if Teledyne has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. They do have the best PE ratio of all the companies, although they're worse than the average because 2.6 has a negative and that kind of skews the average. Price to sales, they're a little worse than the average. Price to book, they're a little worse than the average. They're doing fine in current ratio, 1.7. The average is a bit high, 2.6. You don't need above two current ratio. ROE, they're doing much better than average at 15%. Average is 10%. Debt, they're doing better than average. They have the lowest debt of all four companies at 24% debt. Market cap, they're a little higher than average at 11 billion market cap, and they don't pay a dividend. Only one company in this industry pays a dividend. So to summarize, I do have them trading at a 19% premium, but their ratios look decent and their financials look really good. This is a really solid company with good fundamentals, good products. They're part of the S&P 500. This is the type of company you wanna invest in and hold long term because it's gonna be there for a long time. So let me know what you think of the video, leave a comment, I reply to everybody's comments. And if you want to become a member of the channel, you can support it for as little as 99 cents or up to $99. Thanks for watching.